welcome to today's webinar, everyone. Thank you for dialing in. Uh, my name is Chris Marsh. I'm a research director here at S&P Global Market Intelligence. Uh, we've partnered with Cantata and Salesforce for this session. They're both sponsoring this webinar. And prior to this webinar, we also undertook a really interesting piece of research with the companies, the insights of which we will uh, delve into during this session. Uh, you'll be hearing from three speakers, including myself. Uh, we'll offer a range of insights on this sort of very timely subject, I think, of how to empower professional services teams during what I think we can probably all agree on a very dynamic and uh, disruptive times. So I'm going to introduce the other two speakers, then I'll follow up with some brief, brief housekeeping notes, uh, and then we'll commence the presentation and discussion. So uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Okay, so with me are two exceptional speakers with a wealth of experience and knowledge. Um, so Sarah, why don't you go first and just uh, just introduce yourself to everyone? Yes, hello, I'm Sarah Jafrida. I am the SVP of delivery at POP. POP is a digital marketing and advertising agency. And in my current role, I oversee the project and program management team, um, as well as our resourcing department. And we implemented Fantastic. Kata, um, several years ago. Awesome. I gather also, Sarah, that you have an interesting side venture in brewing. Is that right? I do. Yes. Uh, my husband and I also own a brewery um, located in Washington. Fantastic. Not uh, not in the least bit jealous. Um, <laughs> Ken, we'd love to hear about you and your background. Please, uh, please share a bit of yourself with us. Sure thing. I don't own a brewery, though I, I'm an amateur barbecue, which goes really good with with uh, with beer. So, uh, but nonetheless, um, <laughs> I'm uh, Ken Ringdahl, I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Cantata. Uh, I have a long history in, in building a uh, set of enterprise SaaS products. Um, you know, been at Cantata for over a year now and uh, lead our day-to-day our -day engineering as well as long-term technical strategy and support functions. Awesome, thank you both. Um, so now before we deep dive into the presentation dialogue, just two really quick notes uh, before we kick off. Uh, first of all, the piece of research that I've referenced already and, you know, the data from which we'll be looking through during this webcast uh, is already published and out there in the wild. So if you want to go and locate that, it can be found on the Cantata website under the resources page. And then just the other second note before we kick off, we're going to have a Q&A segment at the end of this webcast. So if we're going through this and you're, you've got some burning questions, uh, please feel free to submit those through the console it's pretty pretty easy to figure out how to do that and then we'll address as many as we can um, when we get there okay so let's uh let's get going so um i mean i use this introduction really to set the stage for various of the discussions that, that i take part in because i think it resonates so strongly with where many organizations are right now so we've had sort of two decades of SaaS growth exponentially increased the number of applications out there, of course, opening up all kinds of fantastic new opportunities in terms of how teams can work with one another, how organizations can perform. And yet the flip side of that sort of explosion of apps um, is that we see lots of challenges with operational silos, technology silos, and all of the things that I think we probably all know flow from that productivity friction, challenges collaborating across divisions and even within teams and you know the undermining of overall business execution as companies try and navigate an increasingly complicated technology landscape. And I would say over the past sort of five years or so, it was certainly a couple of, a couple of years prior to the pandemic period, when we began to see sort of flash on our surveys, a signal that organizations were realizing that they increasingly had to take this as actually a really strategic issue, right? It can and does for many companies fragment customer engagement, it can and does for many companies lead to employee, employee disengagement, and it can really disrupt alignment across the organization. And so for professional services teams, you know, selecting the right technologies that can match their unique industry requirements is obviously uh, an essential task uh, currently. So let me just, uh, before we sort of dive into the detail, let me just sort of give a bit of context around what this piece of research was. 
So we went out and we surveyed senior professionals from both sort of dedicated professional services organizations and from in-house PS teams uh, in companies across the UK, Germany, and the US. Uh, we had a particular focus in the research on the sort of project management side of how teams operate. Really importantly, in terms of you know who was giving us responses, they all played a part in their organization in either decision-making or had influence over the technologies and the tools that their teams use. So that allowed us to really delve into a lot of the detail around what they think their tools are and aren't providing them. So super interesting um, survey sample. Um, Ken, let me sort of turn to you briefly. I think it'd be interesting for the audience to um, understand a little bit more why Cantata wanted such a strong emphasis in this research on the sort of project management aspects of, of how PS teams operate. Yeah, happy to, Chris. And as you said, you know, we um, we we directly serve uh, what we call PSOs, professional services organizations. You know, full full service uh, service organizations, as well as ESOs, embedded service organizations. So, you know, this research is is aimed directly at at what our client base is, and you know, living that on a day to day basis. You know, we know that the project management technology landscape can be overwhelming. You know, there's a lot of players, a lot of solutions. We'll hear a lot about that today, uh, but there's very specific use cases that the PS industry has, um, you know, and, and we'll hear some of that. Sarah will share some of her experiences that will bring some of that to light here. Uh, but we know that projects are the vehicle, you know, of success, you know, that for, for PS organizations, and that's what really the center of the universe for PS orgs. And so, uh, you know, some of the reasons we wanted to see this research, uh, despite our vertical focus and our, you know, focus purely on professional services, we've seen, you know, Cantata show up in industry rankings with general project management, and we see customers using general project management solutions to solve their PS needs. Um, we felt this research would bring to light, you know, some of those challenges and help us better understand how we can help our customers and why, you know, maybe some CWM tools, uh, for example, are, are being used. Uh, you laid out the friction, like we want to under, better understand that friction, what's slowing down PS organizations, where there's room for increased efficiency and productivity gains and how, how we can help those PS orgs. And then, you know, lastly, resource management is so closely tied to project management uh, for PS organizations. You know, we felt that would also provide quite a bit of value and in, in, uh, understanding of data that we can then uh, go and deliver. That's really a strength of, of our products and we want to figure out how we can emphasize that strength and build on that for our customers. Brilliant. Yeah, re really useful context just to kind of set the parameters around this research. Uh, totally agree on this sort of how noisy this space is. This is an area I've covered for a long time. Lots of similar language from different tool providers. I think often more similarity in the language than is actually reflected in the products themselves. So yeah, it's a uh, can be a confusing space, I think, for technology decision makers. Okay, so th the agenda is going to be pretty straightforward. We're going to examine, you know, really what is challenging professional services leaders currently, both in the sort of wider context of their organizations and then specifically around delivery. Uh, we'll rely on Sarah and Ken to provide us with additional context and sort of real world insights from their experience related to the data. And then following that, we'll pivot to discuss some of the potential solutions to those uh, challenges that we'll highlight. So let me just sort of kick off and, and begin sharing some of the data that came out of this piece of research. So I think a, a lot of what the data shows is that, you know, this industry is facing some really significant challenges. And um, that's probably stating the obvious, maybe. I'm pretty sure everyone on the call uh, can sort of live through that and have experienced it. I mean, look at the top one here. One, one of the challenges inevitably is, is adapting to increase remote and asynchronous work. So this is having a big impact. We, we all know the sort of two sides of this coin. Employees can obviously gain significantly from, um, you know, adopting to more of a, a remote or hybrid model, work-life balance and those kind of considerations. But we also see data in the survey that shows a noticeable and you know, possibly correlated decline in employees' ability to forge trust with their colleagues, to maintain focus, to gain clarity around their roles and responsibilities. All those kind of things have, have really had, uh, you know, big flashing red lights around them when we look at the survey data. 
And so this shift um, is really reshaping both, I think, the value that organizations are delivering to customers, but it's obviously also altering the sort of professional experience within the industry for those that actually work in it. Another challenge is the you know, complexity around talent acquisition and retention and the use of contractors. It's been a pretty volatile, uh, unpredictable labor market in, in recent years. All of this is very pivotal for professional services organizations as they think about how to staff their different projects. And then, of course, we've got, like as with everybody else, economic uncertainty that adds yet another layer of complexity, right? So customers very carefully reviewing project scopes and their cost management practices wanting more pricing transparency from their PS partners. Customers also seeking new engagement models, more flexible service offerings, more predictable results from their projects. So an awful lot um, going on that's impacting uh, folks that play in this space. I was thinking, Sarah, maybe I can just ask you a, a question sort of right off the, off the bat. So, you know, lots of challenges of, of lots of different types, cultural, mm -hmm. operational, economic, does this data resonate with you and how is pop as an organization navigating these you know what are obviously pretty disruptive times yes this is all very familiar um unfortunately very familiar and i think as an agency our ability to really efficiently and effectively work and kick off work quickly um is so critical to our overall health and well-being uh, as, as in terms of how we perform and, and how our team members feel and one thing we run into constantly as an agency is our clients have needs and expectations and we need to be accommodating to those. And so one issue we often face is, um, I need to go, I wanna kick off now. I wanna kick my project off tomorrow. And how do we as an agency properly support that ask with the information we have? And prior to our Cantata implementation, we didn't have insights to the right information that helped us understand what that would mean. What would a kickoff tomorrow really mean um, what would the implications and ripple effects be? And what would be required for us to really support that ask in the right way possible? Uh, and one way that this would play itself out, if I can give a little example, would be the tool we used prior would only give us visibility to weekly resourcing allocations. So we would see designer Joe has 30 hours on his schedule. So it would appear Joe had the ability to take on a new project um, and we could support a kickoff tomorrow. But what it didn't show was really what those 30 hours required. And what often would happen is those 30 hours would require three conflicting client deadlines all on a Wednesday. And so because our decision makers didn't have that visibility, they really were not um, empowered to help make the right decisions for our agency and for our team members. Mm -hmm. And now that we have that visibility, we can be a lot more thoughtful around what this truly means, right? Does it mean we need to bring in contractors? Does it mean we're going to be disruptive to other work? Because before it might look good on paper, the resourcing model might look right, but it's not grounded in reality. Um, and that's a, that's a big challenge. And at the end of the day, inefficiencies are incredibly costly. So our big goal is to be as efficient as possible um, and make decisions that allow us to be efficient as possible. And the way we do that is through information and data. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. It's the kind of combination that we'll talk, I think as a thread through the rest of this presentation of like velocity, agility, scale, visibility, and yeah, if, if you're having to do those things based on mixed information, then that's that's uh, going to lead to a, a lot of pain, I think. So um, talking of pain, um, <laughs> let's have a look at this this piece of data. So, you know, obviously lots of pressures facing the industry, you know, organizations feeling the strain as they try and navigate all of these changes. Um, you know, I've covered sort of project management as, you know, for a long time as an analyst, and particularly when it's large scale, and I think particularly also when it's, you know, customer centric, it's always been fraught with challenges, right? Meeting budget requirements, quality, timeline, objectives. This is notoriously difficult stuff, especially in complex environments. However, I think the statistics we're seeing from PS teams are particularly stark from this survey data and, and quite telling. So, um, you know, where it's a sort of a fifth on the left-hand side, so 20% of PS leaders from the survey report that less than half of their projects met the intended budget quality and timeline goals. So that's pretty stark. You then have only around half uh, can say that over 70% of their projects achieve these targets. So, you know, pretty interesting data, pretty stark. And I think it sort of underscores the extent to which 
you know the challenges um, that you know the scope of challenges that organizations are faced with so let's sort of drill down into the next level down of this detail and just look at some of the some of the specific challenges that that teams uh, are facing so you know obviously I think everyone on this call is going to be aware you know PS delivery teams are often juggling hundreds of billable projects simultaneously and you know to close the gap between the sort of project scope and execution often requires you know continuous contextualized coordination throughout the project life cycle through you know forecasting sales staffing billing delivery and you know project analysis and you know that coordination has to be capable enough to also manage the evolving needs of clients as projects get underway and as, as they begin to be executed against also you know insights from individual projects are likely needed to be synthesized into you know resourcing and decision making at the portfolio level some of what um, sarah touched on a moment ago and so obviously accomplishing all of that is obviously far from straightforward. And, you know, we can see where some of those sort of main uh, friction points come out in the survey data. So whether it's, you know, particular challenges in terms of scale and agility when it's executing projects or standardizing on delivery methods or, you know, adjusting to fluctuating client needs. When we asked about collaboration, a lot of it was around, you know, not having that single source of truth, again, sort of uh, referencing back to a comment Sarah anecdotally made about, you know, if you don't have the right information, then it's going to be difficult for you to make good decisions that then lead to good service delivery quality. And, you know, plenty of pain points also around skilling strategies, you know, difficulties in quickly being able to match, you know, available skills to requirements on projects. So lots of uh, different pain points um, that obviously companies are facing around these issues, not helped by the sort of technology disjointedness that we've we've talked about a bit already so sarah i'll come back to you again in a moment but before i do that let's just quickly sort of look at this data um so you know previous slide key challenges that teams are facing this is a little bit more you know where teams are focusing their efforts to improve so you know if you could improve anywhere where would it be so as you can see sort of top to bottom you know key priorities are enhancing collaboration so within teams, with clients, st with stakeholders, it's also about resource management throughout the project lifecycle. It's about having the agility to accommodate necessary changes. It's improving scenario modeling so that you can get better planning and forecasting. And so that, you know, complex interdependencies can be managed across projects. So lots of different areas that teams are sort of listing as priority for them to improve on. So Sarah, let me throw a couple of different questions at you if I can. So the, fir the first one, um, that data on the previous or the two slides ago about the proportion of projects that don't meet goals was pretty stark. It's a big question to you, pretty much the $64,000 question. But as the head of delivery in your organization, you know, what kind of broad insights can you offer around you know, best practices to avoid some of the pitfalls? And, and again, where does technology fit in? It would be interesting if you can delve into that in a little bit more detail. Yes, yeah. So for us, um, a big theme I have is we want to position ourselves to be able to be more proactive versus reactive. And we love data, but we have to be able to use data in the right way. And what I love is when you have the right dashboards, reports, or views in place, it can really help paint really clear and powerful pictures that I find can help diffuse potential situations or challenges that otherwise might um, be really challenging or toxic to an agency or a company culture. Because when you have the right data, those performance challenges, either on the project level or on the individual level, they're no longer subjective, right? The data is factual. And when you're dealing with things that are not subjective, people can shift their mindset and their focus to be more on reflection and solutioning versus defensiveness or you know excuses or justifications. And for us, that shift in mindset was huge because we were using data not to discipline, but to educate. And then when we educate, we can say, hey, these are the patterns we're seeing. This is this one individual happens to be burning hot on a consistent basis. You know, three out of the four projects they own, they seem to overbill. Let's index on that. What's going on? Is it a miss is it a skill set gap? Is it a performance issue? Um, and it allowed us to index and have really thoughtful conversations without it feeling accusatory, 
because it's just the data, right? Oh, you needed more time. Help us understand why you needed more time. Um, and just those small shifts, what we found was it allowed us to be a little bit more proactive in catching potential issues. And then we could navigate them with minimizing um, you know, risks and, and negative implications down the road. So a lot of the reasons why we're able to maintain our successful delivery rate is because we're getting ahead of those moments of, oh no, I'm not set up, I can't meet this deadline, I have conflicting issues, I'm being pulled on another project um, along those lines. I, I would say the other factor is what I found is any true talented PM, they love to run a tight ship, they take pride in running a tight ship and they want that accountability and ownership but for them to do that, they have to have access to information. And so there was a time prior when we were working with multiple tools where I could not give my PMs the insights to information that they wanted and craved to really do the job that they felt they needed to do. And that was a big unlock for us. Um, it was a retention play as well. I was like, if I'm gonna keep best in breed PMs, I have to be able to give them the things that they want and that they enjoy um, as part of their job. It's not just schedule management, right? There's so much more to the job than that. Um, I could go on forever, but I'll take a beat there because that might have. <laughs> Yeah, uh, super interesting. I think the sort of cultural element that you were sort of pointing to of, you know, having the data was, was, you know, really made me think of some of the research I've seen, actually internal research to S&P Global um, that, that was on our intranet. And it basically said, um, you know, good quality conversations between people and their managers is one of the highest drivers of productivity and engagement. So, you know, the whole idea of data, not for discipline, but data for good quality conversations and engagement for improvement, I thought was a point uh, re really well made. Super interesting to hear about that. Um, okay, the second question I had to you was really about leadership. Um, there was lots of really interesting things in the survey, some very sort of telling insights. I think there's a mixed, I think what it showed was a mixed perception out there of company leadership. You know, there are concerns over how work is distributed across teams and whether that's done fairly or not. There's concerns around the clarity of goals. You know, are people given enough clarity around what it is that's being asked of them? Um, I think only 42% of respondents in the survey felt that leadership really understood the pressures that delivery teams were under. So fewer than half feel as though that's understood. So, it, you know, it seems that a more robust partnership between, you know, leadership, delivery, finance operations is probably needed in lots of companies and so as part of you know pops leadership team what what are your thoughts on sort of forging these partnerships and i guess you know that point about data you know what data is needed mm -hmm. to enable leadership to come together to make good quality collective decisions yes yeah for us um there were lots of different data points that we knew were critical utilization was one of them because at a leadership level, there is a strong desire when new work and opportunities come in to maximize the team, right? We need to be as utilized as possible. And when we have a client who's ready to go, we are highly motivated to want to capitalize on that opportunity. So for us, creating dashboards and views that helped paint the picture of what the reality was really helped us go back and have the right conversation with leadership to say, hey, I know this might look this way, but this is the reality of what this means. This is the other clients and projects that you're going to be jeopardizing if we make this move. Because um, what they would see often, right, going back to my example before, Joe has 30 hours, he, all they see is there's an underutilized employee and I have an opportunity and a client who wants to work with us. Go. What's the problem? Right? And the problem is, well, we didn't even get into, is it a skill set match? Do we have the right team members to actually deliver on the specifics of this project? What does the timing look like? PM, you know, 1 p.m. is not a universally a good fit for all projects. There's different contract types, different models. And so we really use the data to help um, navigate those conversations. So again, bring it out of subjectivity into here's the reality. This is what the project needs. These are the skills it requires. These are the hours that are, and when they're gonna hit. And here are the scenarios, right? We can bring in a contractor that has a hard cost, but by doing so, we're protecting this client and this project. And we're able to ensure that this timeline is not gonna be at risk or jeopardized. Um, so I think, again, that they just sparked a lot of really good conversations and um, there's always going to be the push and desire to do more, to take on more. And it's bringing it down to, but at what cost? And being able to articulate that in a way that really resonates with your stakeholders or leadership team. And for us, it comes down to inefficiencies are costly, contractors are costly, 
and we're really um, dedicated to more team morale and retention. So too much churn, too much spin is ultimately not going to be able to retain top talent. And we want to retain top talent because we know how beneficial those individuals are to our client relationships and to the quality of our outputs. Got it. Super interesting. Just curious as like a, just a, a sort of build onto your comments. Um, was it difficult when you were defining those dashboards and views to actually agree on what should be showed in them? Because I've seen signals in some of our research in the past that that can actually in some organizations be a stumbling block. There is just a different view around what value creation is considered to be in your organization and what metrics that go along with tracking that. Any particular challenges you found around that or was the sort of broad consensus of the things that needed to be visualized? Oh, no, there was. Yeah, that was definitely a challenge for sure. I, I think we we handle that in a couple different ways. One, we do limit visibility to certain information. So there are a lot of permissions and rules that you can set within the tool, which are fantastic so that the information is there, but only disclosed and available to certain um, levels. So that's one. And then we did spend a lot of time up front aligning on what are the key KPIs for the core business units within our agency that's going to be using this tool the most. So for us, it was project management, resourcing, finance, and overall operations. HR fell into that. And we dedicated a lot of time up front. We actually had a committee with representatives of each of those groups to say, what do you need to be successful? What are your what do we believe are the key KPIs that you need? to do your job? What are your wish list items? What are the, the challenges and frustrations you have with our co current tool? Um, and then aligned on a set of core goals, metrics, data that we could then use as a foundation to make decisions as we went through the implementation process. Because as you go through that, you're going to be confronted with lots of, well, is this important or not important? And how do we capture this specific um, data point? And that just helps keep us all aligned through that journey. Got it. Super interesting. So Ken, we'll, we'll go on to talk about what we mean by the project life cycle in a minute, but any, any reflections on anything Sarah just shared? I mean, you, I'm assuming you sort of see similar things amongst other Cantata clients out there. We, we absolutely do. And I'll, and I'll say, you know, everything Sarah said resonates really, really well. And, and maybe on that last point, um, you know, some of our most successful customers, the ones that are adopting our product and rolling it out, using it day to day and getting the return on investment are, are the ones that are building, you know, custom analytics, custom reports, they're surfacing the data. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're our most successful customers, w without a doubt. It, it is probably our number one identifier of adoption of our products and success of our customers. Yeah, super interesting. Okay, let's um, let's keep this ball rolling. So Ken, why don't you take us through this one? Talk us through how sort of Cantata thinks about the overall project lifecycle. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, we um, certainly this this is our, our you know a, a standard project lifecycle. We like to call it the value chain um, because we we like to inject value at each step along the way here. Um, and you know we're we're here to talk about projects, and we know that uh, you know projects are are kind of the center of the universe. You see right there around deliver, like that is the core center of of a of a PS org is is actually the delivery. But there's so much other parts that go with that, uh, and we know PS orgs can't be good at just project execution. You know those projects are client facing, revenue generating. They have to provide value for the business, for clients. You know Sarah talked about. The employee experience—that's something that that we've uh, we're leaning in more and more towards, and and really understand that you know the use of our products and and how we can engage the employee experience is really uh, key to the success of our customers overall. Um, and you know all of these aspects from planning the staffing to time capturing to billing—they all have to operate in lockstep. You know they're all interrelated, uh, and so that's why we see it as a as the full sort of value chain life cycle any disruption along that value chain will have cascading effects. Um, you know, so because of that, what we see is the technology needs of PS orgs are unique. Uh, you know, the business is reliant, not just on those projects, but revenue generating, generating projects. Sarah talked about sort of efficiency. Like we know that, that PS organizations run on, you know, thin margins and sort of the ability to, you know, make sure that, you know, that person that is, is filled for 30 hours and may have more time, there's visibility to that 
And so bringing that forward through this whole through this whole chain, um, you know, so we need to accelerate that value for our PS organizations and through the project life cycle, it's planning, estimating, staffing, billing, analyzing, forecasting, like it is all of that leads to a efficient project delivery and ultimate client and client success for our customers. Um, you know, so what we're seeing here, this is one project. I mean, just think of this in, in three dimensions, right? This is this is the two dimension view of that for every project. You've got them layered, they're at different levels. And so it really highlights the need to have a platform that uh, that can interweave these, give that visibility that Sarah talked about. Um, you know, some of the drawbacks of the old ways of thinking uh, or the or, or old tools um, just don't give you that visibility. You know, we think of customer, a lot of customers come to us with, you know, they're using it on spreadsheets and they're trying to compare this spreadsheet to that one. And, and it's just, they're, they're probably doing is the, the best job they possibly can, but their ceiling is very low in terms of, of what they can actually accomplish. And so, you know, our vertical focus allows us to really go deep uh, and provide the ability to automate and, and deliver and, and report and provide analytics to help, you know, the pops of the world uh, run their business. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of how we see it. Like I said, the, you know, the linear, this is a linear view of it, but you have to really think of it three dimensionally and 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 how complex that gets. Um, you know, really, as we, as we see like an organization like Pop and a few hundred, few hundred people, sweet spot for us. I mean, it's really anyone over 50, you know, it becomes very, very challenging and, and we'll need a solution like this. Yeah, very interesting set of insights. Um, you know, the point you were making about sort of the growing importance of thinking about the employee experience, um, have my own sort of an anecdotal comment on that. So I, in S&P, I run the workforce productivity team where we think a lot about employee experience. We have a, a separate research practices that focuses on everything customer experience technologies. About a year ago, we actually joined in the same group and called it the experiences group for this very reason, right? More companies are wanting our help to help them tell that story. What does it look like? And you're right, essentially, essentially it's an infinity loop. One, one uh, impacts the other, you then get the insights that come back to think about how you can then support your teams in operating more efficiently. And then that hopefully is seen downstream in the, in the customer experience. And then, you know, it's, it's a sort of loop. So yeah, great, um, great points. Okay, so let's, um, let's continue to think about then some of the solutions to some of the challenges that we've sort of highlighted. So I began today's session really talking about silos and fragmentation and, and we've sort of each sort of riffed on that a little bit as we've gone through this. I think much of the data we've looked at so far really, you know, points to the, the, the dangers of this technological disjointedness. Um, this really actually goes beyond the professional service in industry, right? It's a broad macro shift that many organizations are struggling with as, as the, at the same time they're seeking more agile operating models. And so a lot of how we think about it in terms of where companies are headed at the moment is that increasingly they are competing in an experience economy, right? Where success is increasingly measured by your ability to generate and monetize sustained engagement, not just with your customers, but also with your employees. So this notion that really what people are uh, competing for at the moment is engagement around experiences, I think is, is becoming more front of view. And so the agility to meet the evolving needs of both customers and, and employees is becoming more and more essential. Um, we see lots of data just on the EX side, just as a sort of adjacent comment that it's becoming a determinant factor in where they decide to work or whether they decide to stay in a company, the quality of the digital experiences they're getting. People want modern tech stacks these days that are not gonna be frustrating to work in and out of. But that, that agility requires a lot, right? So it requires an integrated approach to synthesizing information and data and people across those project life cycles. And, you know, I think one of the things we've found a lot that's dawning more and more on companies is that, you know, relying on APIs to connect a patchwork of niche tools or generalist applications has proved much more difficult than I think the promises made 10, 15 years ago in SaaS. Um, you know, th th that promise hasn't really been fulfilled in other words. And so in response, we do see businesses start to invest in more 
consolidated and customizable applications tailored for their own unique industry needs. Uh, of course, every industry has its own specific capability requirements, integration with particular backend platforms. And I think increasingly with the rise of AI and machine learning and some of the newer generative AI initiatives, specialized data models and training algorithms are not far behind us as well. And so, you know, investments are gravitating towards technologies that offer that best blend of context, collaboration and control is one of the ways we think about it. Difficult to get that when you're working in and out of lots of different uh, tools. And so in the professional services sector, I think this is like at least one of the ways in which this is seen is in the desire of resourcing and delivery teams for maximum flexibility in the how of work, but crystal clear clarity and alignment on the what and the why as they manage their uh, different projects. I think this point is worth just calling out again. This, this came out of the, the piece of research, the survey data is very interesting. You know, the question went something like, um, you know, when you think about the different tools and technologies you use every day, what are your key obstacles? Uh, and as you can see highlighted here, the top most commonly cited issue was information is too siloed. It makes it difficult to use. It makes it difficult to find. We can't collaborate across it. We, it's spread across different repositories and, and technologies. And even if we look further down the list here, you see sort of related issues, right? It's not enough apps do enough of what we need them to do. In other words, there's too many apps that need to go into the life cycle. There's poor integration across those apps. It doesn't really deliver the workflows that we need. It's difficult to collaborate across this complicated technology environment. So this is, this is the sort of pervasive problem with the, the tool and technology landscape. So um, just a little bit more data before we then sort of seg into, uh, you know, in, into a bit more of the conversation. You know, what we found, I think, from, the, from other of the data in the survey was that, you know, countering that fragmentation, businesses are increasingly looking for those technologies that allow them to run, you know, data-driven initiatives that span both the CX and EX, as we've talked about. We know from sort of analyzing the survey data that the high performing PS teams really want technologies that allow them to make data driven decisions with the integrated information, the visibility, the process maturity, so that they can get that alignment across stakeholders and with, with customers along the project life cycle. So this goes beyond just project management capabilities. This is end to end financial management from quote to cash. This is detailed resource management capabilities this includes you know forecasting and capacity planning at both the sort of project and portfolio levels this is also about you know possessing the business intelligence to measure you know bid win ratios project profitability on time delivery customer engagement all these kind of things right metrics that are vital to inform project planning portfolio management account management decisions and you know, for all of those capabilities to be effective and to operate cohesively, you need strength on the back end. You need robust workflow. You need security. You need governance controls. You need efficient data management. So an awful lot needs to happen as, as you know, the signals we're getting from the survey work. An awful lot needs to happen for clients to be really satisfied. I think it was telling in the survey that only 42% of the PS leaders we interviewed said that they think they're really good at including clients through the project life cycles. So that's fewer than half say we're actually really good at that. So that's a core, a core pain point. So, you know, firms need a, a sort of deliberate strategy that merges, you know, technology innovation, you know, you know business model innovation, and, and certainly this level of data driven engagement requires, you know, various capabilities um, that support the project uh, life cycle in uh, sort of unison. Um, sort of going to one of the, the comments that Ken made sort of in the, in the introduction about, you know, uh, what he sees across sort of Cantata's customer base, you know, generalist tools versus sort of industry solutions. You know, we had a really interesting set of questions in the survey um, all around this issue. Um, so, you know, lots of those core capabilities that we see teams saying that they really need in their technology solutions, that's difficult to stitch together or to custom create and generalize tools. 
And, you know, many industries are encountering the same issue, right? They need more specific kinds of tooling as their customer requirements become more complex, more precision, higher velocity at scale. It clearly is, is raising the bar for how PS teams need to operate. And I think the challenges inherent in using non-specialized tools for professional services work, you know, came out and this is really the data that you're seeing now. So, you know, there is a whole spectrum of different uh, workspaces, work management technologies, highly flexible, used across many different business domains to manage different kinds of work. In the survey itself, it was the second most mentioned primary category of tools that PS teams were using after professional services automation tools, so PSA uh, tools. Um, however, among those that said they were using like a collaborative work management solution, a range of challenges was evident. So it's uncommon, for example, for those kind of tools to have specific features supporting financial management of projects. It's uh, unusual for them to have specific integrations into financial software systems. Some may do, but most I think probably don't. Um, they, again, some, some may have some capabilities around resource management and capacity planning capabilities. A lot of, a lot of the generous tools out there don't. So each PS business really needs to make the right choice about you know, what capabilities they need, which tools best suit their own purpose. Um, but as the data shows, there is a clear set of trade-offs in, in having maybe the, the flexibility, um, user engagement around generalist tools, but maybe not having the specific kinds of capabilities that are actually gonna make a difference in terms of performance. So Sarah, um, maybe I could throw another question your way mm -hmm. again. Um, can I ask you your opinion of this data and you know, specifically sort of any pros and cons from your experience of you know, dedicated solutions versus more generalist mm -hmm. ones? Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised by this. I think this is definitely what we were feeling. Um, and it's really interesting because for us, it's, it's really indexing on, you know, you talk about project financial performance, but what does that really mean, right? What do you, it, it's so complicated in so many ways. And so for us, it was figuring out what does the agency need? What does the project manager need? And what does the team need in terms of visibility to what a successful financial management of a project is? Um, so for us, we aligned on, for example, gross margin a simple term that we could use universally across our teams to say, how is the project performing? Well, we're going to use GM. And we infuse that in our custom dashboards and our insight reports so that anyone working on a project, anyone within the agency could use a common language and could see a quick metric, a quick, a quick statistic um, that would give a, an instant read on how the project is performing. Um, and in terms of multiple tools and um, consolidation under one, for us, the biggest win was being able to connect project schedules with resourcing, with time tracking. Before, we had three separate tools for that. Um, and each of them were able to function in their own silo. But it, you really need to see those performing together to truly be able to manage a project and have a feel for how is it performing um, and to give the agency insights into uh, utilization and team bandwidth. Um, I'm not sure if that exactly answered your question, so let me know if you'd want me to go down a different path on that one. Yeah, no, I think that was it. It was, you know, um, you know, it's just really the picture of what you had before and what you have now, and you know, what were those pieces that really make sense to have together, rather than, you know, going through that work of custom integrating different tools to try and get the either the data and the dashboards that you need, or just the workflows that you need across projects. So. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a recurring theme we see across lots of different industries. Actually, um, the SaaS explosion hasn't just affected the PSA, the, the professional services industry. It's it's affecting everyone, and I think everyone is sort of struggling with the same the same kind of thing. Okay, so uh, super interesting uh, reflections, uh, Ken. I'm going to come to you in a, in a moment on the next slide, but uh, just sort of almost by means of summary, I'm just going to uh, give a few additional thoughts here. Um, so this is a big uh, shift, right? I mean, I think in some ways this is the next sort of turn in the sign curve of enterprise software, right? So you can go back a couple of decades and we were with monoliths and heavyweight applications. SaaS disintermediated a lot of that, fragmented the landscape, lots of new brilliant things that companies can do, but with that, all the pain points of that fragmentation. And so I think it feels like we're almost going into a new era of consolidation into more flexible kinds 
of modular enterprise platform. So it's, you know, I think a lot of us on our side of the fence in the analyst world feels as though this is really the, the precipice of the next uh, sort of shift, if you like. Um, so what does that mean? You know, it means more consolidated kinds of technology solution where you can do that synthesis of information and data and people across different silos. We see that prominently in the sort of project and work management domains. It is happening elsewhere, though. Um, and this is, I think, somewhat of a cultural shift and a mindset shift for technology leaders, you know, anyone involved in making decisions around technology. But also, it's an experience shift for employees and customers. I think everyone needs to get used to different expectations that uh, uh, both customers and employees have around the technologies that they're working in and out of every day. And so this sort of shift, I think we're seeing is really a response to, you know, a lot of those uh, sort of prevailing challenges. So Ken, let me um, let me come to you on this just before we sort of seg towards uh, wrap up and open Q&A with the audience. Uh, maybe you take us through, you know, how Cantata's, you know, what is the sort of macro view of Cantata in terms of the components of a of an industry solution? Yeah, happy to. And, and you're really starting to get into my wheelhouse here as the CTO. We're talking about some of our technology and our platform. Um, you know, I'll, I'll hit on a few things here. One, um, you know, when we think about sort of the, the product portfolio we have and, and how we solve those solve problems for our for our customers. Um, you know, one thing that we've started to to really talk more about is is this as a PS cloud. Um, you know, when you think of cloud, you know, if you think of sort of a hyperscaler, what do you think of? You think of ubiquitously available, anywhere available, infinitely scalable. And we think about that with, with our vertical for professional services organizations. Because when I think of sort so of PSA, for example, like I think, you know, but rigid, not, not super flexible. And, and so when we think of our platform and we think of it as a professional services cloud, and so looking at, at this here, you know, I'll, I'll touch on a few things, you know, really at the center there, we already sort of landed and talked about this a little bit, the business intelligence and insights, that, that's that's right, in, like if you think of this as a bullseye, like th that's in the middle for a reason, like that is so key to getting value and, and, and helping our professional services orgs, um, you know, drive their business and, and increase that gross margin, as Sarah was saying, and, um, and, and really just be more efficient. Um, there's other things that that wrap around that. Um, you know, certainly uh, when we think of building a solution for PS orgs, you know, we've talked a few times here about, you know, some maybe horizontal solutions that that are sort of uh, they're everything to everyone, but they're not like deeply uh, purpose built like the Cantata platform is purpose built. It's been built by professional services people for, you know. For, for professional services organizations. Um, the, you've talked about point solutions and a, and a platform, like it's so key that, that and, and you see that the concentric rings here, like all of these need to talk to each other. They need to understand, like, if you make a change to a project, like your resource planning is gonna, you, you need to see that effect in resource planning. And so for one thing, you know, to be able to impact another and be immediately in real time, see the impacts of that change. And then ultimately, you know, as we get to the outside, the integrations and workflows, this is so critical to how we come into a customer and integrate there, because we're not trying to come in and replace everything a customer has. Um, you know, we, we want to, they, the, the solutions like HTM solutions, a Workday or a Bamboo, CRM solutions, whether it's Salesforce or, um, HubSpot and you know GLs and ERPs like there are other systems that need to integrate with the PS cloud and the tightness of those integrations and the reliability of that uh, are so important this is what you know we start to look at our delivery uh, of you know we have a, a product that we deliver but then we have an implementation and how we sort of integrate that is as important as the product itself and we look at the platform like that that bridge to some of these other systems is so, so important uh, to, to the success, uh, long-term success of, of our customers and, and how they utilize our product. Fantastic, really, uh, really good context as, as uh, you know, around what, what you're seeing. Um, 
Okay, so let's um, let's sort of you know seg our way towards the Q and A. Um, I'm not going to read through these implications. They're pretty sort of self-explanatory, I think. I'd rather take the opportunity, Stere, maybe just to throw another question your way, and then we'll open it up into the sort of broad uh, open audience Q and A. Um, mm -hmm. So what would you say to a leader who's maybe uh, in the audience right now, whose business is in a similar position to the one Pop was in, you know, considering changing their technology approach, but worried about, you know, maybe the extra scrutiny that they're going to get from any proposals, you know, a lot of, you know, proposed tech investments in orgs are getting extra scrutiny now, given the sort of macroeconomic environment that companies are operating in. So what would you sort of say to them, and in particular, how, how should they build a business case for the change? What are your thoughts? Yes, um, so I'm, I'm a big fan, obviously. It, it's been so so such a positive impact on our business and, and our teams and how we work and function. And what I would say is, I think, first and foremost, to be really aware that it's not just a financial investment, but it's also a, a, an investment of time. And I think what Ken was alluding to is those custom dashboards and reports. Those really are the most powerful um, output that I think we we got from this tool, right? It brought our brought our um, teams together, it unified our tool set, but also we were able to create things that truly worked for our agency. And from a leadership and stakeholder standpoint, there's a lot of power in that. So it's asking your teams, asking your leads, what do you want? What do you need? And then having the confidence to know that this tool can deliver upon that if set up in the right way. And if you can really take the time to do your homework and invest in, in making those custom insights, reports, and dashboards. Um, the tool itself is very robust and to be honest, was a little overwhelming at first. So I think my advice would be don't get distracted by all the bells and whistles. Focus on what you know your business needs and be really thoughtful about not disrupting current workflows and tools that are working really well. So for example, Slack is something our team members love. There is a communication tool within Katata that is great. It works really well, but for us, disrupting that wasn't worth it, right? That risk wasn't worth the reward. Where on the other hand, the time tracking tool now within Katata is way better than what we had before. So we really wanted to focus our organization's energy on the changes that were gonna have the biggest impact positively and not disrupt the work. Um, minimize the disruption on work. And so I think going into it with that uh, mindset could be really helpful as well. Super, yeah, focus on focus on what's gonna make a difference and, and not disrupting things where it, you're not necessarily gonna get the, the payoff without a lot of pain. Yeah, very, very sage advice, I think. So um, Ken, Sarah, really appreciate both of your insights so far. Let's just uh, open this up into the uh, audience Q and A. Um, Anyone listening in, if you've got any questions, please do submit them through the console. Uh, we'll, we've got a few minutes to get to them before the, the top of the hour. Um, so let's, let me just sort of scan the list of questions that have already been submitted. Um, Ken, this one here, may, maybe this goes to you. Um, and Sarah, if you have any opinions on it, you can chime in as well. This kind of um, relates a, a little bit to what you were saying, Ken, about you know, the goal is not to sort of replace everything, right? There's, you know, an ecosystem around any core system of, of uh, essential technologies. So the question is, you know, is there a danger that in embracing a shift to a consolidated platform, a platform tries to consolidate too many disparate capabilities leading to functionality in certain areas that truly can't match up to the best of breed level? So what, what would you say to that, Ken? Yeah, I will... Uh... I'll maybe surface a few things that we've we've mentioned throughout the hour here. Um, you know, one that uh, that we aren't trying to replace everything. If you have a a tool uh, that that's working really well for you, that that is doing you know one of the functions that we do, whether it's you know time and expense, or you know often we have customers that bill outside or invoice outside of the Cantata platform. By all means, you should you should move ahead and 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 leverage that, but. I will say, you know, um, as we've as we've mentioned, a lot of these sort of horizontal solutions that are uh, a little bit to everything, but not a lot to anything in particular. You know, we we have a very vertical focus on PS orgs, and if you're a PS org that needs a solution, um, everything that we've done has been purpose built for your organization, and. Um, you know, they're, uh, I, I would encourage people to look at how much of the platform they can adopt. Um, 
and uh, but not bite off more than they can chew. Uh, and and there's you know oftentimes we see customers do this in phases. You know they start with resource management. Hey, you know we've got a really as I mentioned at the top like. We have a really strong resource management. We have some customers that start there and say, we're just going to do resource management out of here. We're going to get comfortable with it. We're going to get our users adopting it. And then we sort of start expand to, to other functions. So um, yeah, that's that's how I would uh, sort of sort of answer uh, yeah. that, that concern overall. Super. Um, Sarah, maybe this next question is a, is a good one to throw your way. Um, so managing resources effectively across projects is a common refrain uh, across much of the data that was shared. What are some of the specific aspects of resource management in a professional services context that more general tools may miss? Mm, uh, I think the day of week resourcing is so invaluable. Like being able to actually see what ta specific tasks and projects are on an individual at any time um, allows you to then be more thoughtful about making decisions around shifting that team member, shifting out a schedule or timeline. It gives you, it arms you with the information you need to move the Jenga pieces around in, in the most uh, non-disruptive way. So I think that was, that was pretty huge. And we definitely do have projects where we resource at the, still at the weekly level, at the task level and at the daily level. So that for us is pretty significant. Fantastic. Ken, any, any thoughts on that? I love the Jenga um, example there because uh, you know it's it's one of the the values that we that we promote is is around you know it's it's so it is so complex and and we talked about the visibility like you know we 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 like to think maybe as like you know one gear turning another gear turning another gear because if one thing changes you know you need to be able to see how that impacts other things and without a solution that that integrates those together. You know, you're you're chasing your tail, uh, trying to figure out what what that actually means, and you probably don't find out about it until you've already felt the effects of it. It's a lagging indicator if if you don't have that yeah. sort of interdependency. Yeah, the Fantastic. timeliness uh, the timeliness is so critical um, to be able to see the immediate in potential impacts or real impacts of a decision. Awesome. Well, I think we're, we're very close to the top of the hour, so pro probably not time for, for any more questions. Thank you, though, for those that submitted them. Um, Sarah and Ken, massive thank you for your insights today. Excellent flavor to layer around the data that came from that piece of research. Just a reminder, if anyone wants access to that research, you'll be able to find it on the, on the Cantata website under the resources section. Obviously, big thanks to the audience for participating today, uh, and please, everyone, have a fantastic rest of your day. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.